may be one of the reasons so many people in the church aren't making disciples of all nations is because they're not really disciples in the first place. You think about Jesus and his disciples from the very beginning to the very end. Making disciples is in the DNA of this thing, right? To be a disciple involves making disciples. Follow me, Matthew 4, and I will, what? I'll make you fishers of men. Never make a gospel appeal to people's emotions. Never. Never. That's why we don't have some kind of an emotional appeal here and play all kinds of smaltzy music in the background. And it amazes me that we believe this, that God would crush and kill his own son, but let you slide. Not for a minute. At this moment, God commands all men to repent and believe that today is the day of salvation, that you are to flee from the wrath to come, to flee from the law of Moses that condemns you into the city of refuge who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Run to him. Welcome G220 radio listeners. This is Mike. And we are here on a Saturday night. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And we're going to dive into some Jehovah Witnesses, some material. We're going uh, to examine them and to think through them with it. So um, here we go. We're going to talk about the question, how can you draw close to God? And we can maybe think of different things about it. Really, this is mostly about prayer, um, going to church and going to the kingdom halls, as they would call it. And then um, meditating on the word. That's how they say you get um, draw close. So we will examine it like we do. We got the PowerPoint with it. So if you're listening live here on Facebook... Drop the comments. I'm going to try to keep it up. It's hard. I only got two screens. I'm not cool like Ricky and having three screens. Um, so drop a line. I'll try to get to it um, as we're going through um, <clears throat> with it. And if you're listening on audio, well, I apologize that you can't interact. But you can always send feedback um, to us on Facebook or our um, email address, which is g220radio at gmail.com. And make sure you join us on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be having a special guest or an interview this coming Tuesday. I'll probably talk about that more at the end of the show about that. So let's get into this. Here it is. How can you draw close to God? Here's the little, here's the PowerPoint. The question, remember, we're going through, this is a pamphlet called Good News from God. And we only got a couple left. So hopefully we will end this here, probably early September with it. So how can you draw close to God? That's the question of, of the hour. And so they have five parts to this question. So in order to answer it, they're going to ask the questions, do God listen to all prayers? So there's something about how we prayer is drawing close to God. And then how should we pray? Um, why do Christians meet together is the third thing. Um, how can you draw close to God and how will drawing close to God benefit you? And we shouldn't be surprised with this idea of benefit at the end because um, this pretty much is what this pamphlet's always been about is um, focusing on kind of you as a person with it so does god listen to all prayers Let's see what they have to say and they start out by saying god invites people of all sorts to draw close to him in prayers they get that from psalm 65 2 which says oh hearer of prayer referring to god to you people of all sorts will come to you and the esv reads all flesh will come um, 
So they're going to say, okay, God invites everyone to pray. And, and, you know, when we think about that in relation with Jesus, Jesus calls the temple a prayer for the nations. The nations are to come to the temple in prayer when he's kicking all these people out because they're making this place of robbery by stealing from the people. And so you have that, um, you have an aspect in that way. Yet they claim, the Jehovah Witness, he does not listen to or accept all prayers. For example, the prayers of a man who mistreats his wife can be hindered. And that's First Peter 3, 7. We know that verse there. At the end of the verse, it says, um, so there are also hairs talking about women with you of undeserved favor of life in order that your prayers may not be hindered. You're to honor the weaker vessel, the, the women. Um in honoring them, your prayers are not hindered. Um, also, when the Israelites persist in badness, evil, sin, why don't you just call it what it is? Badness sounds so terrifying, like you've sinned against the Creator. Um, God refused to hear their prayers. Clearly, prayer is a privilege. Nevertheless, God will accept the prayers of even gross sinners if they repent. With that, and we see that. Um, no doubt. So in the Isaiah passages, it talks about how God basically said, I'm not listening to you because you've sinned. But I also want to consider a couple other verses because I think mostly we can agree with them. But there's some other verses that are kind of a little bit more um, hard hitting when we examine or when we think about some of this. And when we consider <clears throat> all of it, so like Proverbs chapter 28, verse nine says, if one turns away from his, from his ear, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So the proverb is, as we've been studying it on the regular show, you know, the idea of wisdom and glorifying or living in wisdom is to fear the Lord and fearing the Lord is to also includes obeying what he has said. And so <clears throat> here in verse nine talks about the one who turns his ears from hearing the law, the one who does not, cannot obey the law. They have not, in our case, they haven't trusted in Christ and have lived in full obedience from that choice. Even his prayer is an abomination. And I, I almost to say that, then God won't listen to those types of prayers. Consider in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 29. The Lord is far, is far from the wicked. But here's the prayer of the righteous. So God is not listening to the the wicked, but he listens to the righteous. Those who are enemies of God, God does not listen to. Those who are friends of God and are called sons of God, he listens to. So in a sense, we can't agree with that. And you know, even with it that God accepts the prayers of even gross sinners – if they repent is the same thing. We would say, yeah, when the first prayer that God hears from us sinners is a prayer to him, repenting of our sins and trusting in the savior. And so for the most part, I think we can agree with that. Yes. Prayer is a privilege, um, in that way. And so to, to look and to consider those, um, ideas with it is very much a you know with it so we can kind of agree with them now we might their understanding of repent is legalistic that is you repent just in your mind and then you do all these things where our understanding of repent comes also with trust and that kind of our repentance is coming out of God saving us where theirs is not in that way. So I think we can agree with them. Does God listen to all prayers? And that's no, though he desires all prayers. You have to come to him in reverence. That's 
John Calvin's kind of idea. If you read in the Institutes, we come in reverence to God with that in it. So we can kind of agree with them on that point. So then the question is, how should we pray? If we're, if we have this privilege as Christians, we're, I mean, you can say, and we'll see it, that we're almost assumed that we'll pray. So how do we do it? And in this first part, they talk about how prayer is a part of our worship. And I just mentioned that the reverence aspect of it, and we should pray to our creator, Jehovah. Um, Matthew 4, 10, then Jesus said to him, go away, saying for it's written, it is Yahweh, your God, that we must worship. And it is to him alone you must render sacred service. Again in 6, 9, you must pray then this way, our Father in heavens. And that's how they have translated it's heaven. Let your name be sanctified. We say hallowed be your name. Um, the command there that we're, we're praying to him. Um, so there's that with it. And they acknowledge that we are imperfect in prayer. and We should pray in the name of Jesus because he died for our sins. Now we already discussed like this, how they see it is just as a, he's ransomed us from the penalties of sins. And so we're to pray with him. It is honor that they, he has this kind of status again, you know, if you remember kind of our study, they kind of believe him as like a demigod in a sense, he is a created being. Um, so you can't really worship. You can't really pray to him. Uh, I'm not getting, there is debates on whether even as Christians, if we are to, we should be praying to Jesus. I'm not going to get into that um, with this aspect. They use John 14, 6. So Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. So they're saying, no, and this passage is dealing with salvation. They're saying that, that in prayers is the same way. Um, Yahweh does not want us to repeat memorized or written prayers. He wants us to pray from our hearts. And now, this one, I'm going to kind of disagree with. I don't think that memorizing prayers or writing prayers down is necessarily not praying from your heart. The Puritan pastors would normally write out their prayers and ways to read before the sermons. Memorizing prayers can be um, are kind of more troublesome and really they're getting this from Matthew 6, 7 says, when you pray, do not say the same things over and over again as the people of the nations do, for they imagine that they will get a hearing for their many use of words. And this is kind of a babbling idea. Um, maybe like the Pharisees just kind of, they're just going and repeating all these things. And I get that, that it's to be a conversation more like. But I don't think memorizing prayers or praying from written prayers is necessarily saying you're not praying from the heart. When you consider the, the book Valley of Vision and all the great prayers that are in there, it should be, we should note that in kind of a way that these were written down to be prayed they are there. Do you pray them word for word? Maybe at times. But let's even just get away from Valley of Vision. What about the Psalms? Now, those are a book of hymns. They're a book of prayers. When we consider Jesus, when he's on the cross, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This, this call of desperation, he's quoting Psalm 22. No, is it wrong to pray to God, God, and say, God, you are my shell you are my shepherd, and I shall not want. You make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me to streams of waters. Is that necessarily wrong to pray that in that way, which is written down? 
or even memorized with it. And so while we can say, I don't think there's this necessary connection or dichotomy between a written prayer and, and or memorized prayer and praying from your heart. That is, you can write down a prayer for, for a sermon if, a, if you're a pastor or you get an opportunity to preach. That you can write down the prayer and go up there and I recite it verbatim from what you have, but have it not it still have it still come from the heart. And so I think this is again maybe a little over spiritualizing of what they're doing. It's about the heart. Come on, you do it. Um and God wants us to pray from the heart. I'm not denying that. I'm just – I think what we should say here, and maybe this is making a mountain out of molehill, that it's okay to have memorized and written prayers. The question is just heaping up all these words to try to, to make yourself look better or thinking that it will get you a hearing with God instead of the fact that you are a child of God and you already have a hearing with God and God – tells us in Hebrews to boldly approach the throne of grace because we have an advocate. So with that, and then they quote Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious over anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, along with thanksgiving, let your petitions be known to God. So, and they continue in answering this question by saying, our creator can even hear silent prayers. Prayers just in your head. Um, they use 1 Samuel 1, 12 through 13. Um, the she in here is Hannah, has been praying a long time before Yahweh. Um, Eli, or sorry. Um, this New World Translation, it just... It messes me up at times because they put weird commas in. I'm not going to lie. I'm Stalin, so I can remember the name. Eli, yeah, was watching her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips were trembling, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk, and so Jesus hears them. He invites us to pray on every occasion, such as the beginning and end of days, at meal times, and when we face problems. Um, and you see that in Psalm 52, throw your burdens on Jehovah, he will sustain you. Matthew 15, he took seven loads of fish, and after offering thanks, he broke them, gave them to him, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. The offering thanks is a prayer to God. And with that, but one thing I do want to know um, before we move on, there is something very striking that they have omitted here i think if we think about it and if you know romans whatsoever you probably already know what i'm gonna say and it's this romans eight twenty six. roman eight twenty six talks about how the spirit will intercede for us in our weakness. Nowhere in this passage and really nowhere in this pamphlet is the Holy Spirit ever talked about. But when we look at Romans 8.26, and I think this is very clear on why we must assert the deity and of both the Son and the Spirit, that they are three persons and one being, is this. The Holy Spirit cannot intercede if it's just a personal or impersonal force. Yet, the language is clear. The Spirit is the subject of something that He is doing. He is doing something. He is interceding for us in our weakness. 
That is, even though we can boldly come to the throne of God, we come in the Spirit, with the Spirit interceding us and helping us, with Jesus interceding and helping us. We need both. And so this is very much a missing theme in this entire pamphlet. Now, people may say Calvin is that way. If you read the Institutes, Calvin does not have a chapter on the Holy Spirit. He has an entire book on the Father. He has an entire book on the Son, but he has nothing on the Spirit. Just like the J-dubs in this pamphlet does. But the one crucial difference between Calvin and the Jehovah Witnesses is this. The Holy Spirit is in every part of the Institutes. You cannot read a part of the Institutes and the Spirit not have some impact on what is written in it. Here in the Jehovah Witness pamphlet, the Holy Spirit is absent completely. And most of the time I have to bring it up because that's how we counter it. They are, and, and part of me, and I don't, tr I try not to research beyond what is, is given here because I want to think through it and, and light of it and to, and really to use this then, okay, your pamphlet is saying this, this is what it seems to say. Um, can you help me understand it? But here's the thing I would go. How does the Holy Spirit fit in the role of prayer? According to Jehovah Witnesses. Because seemingly it doesn't. Unless for some reason this impersonal force can go backwards. Like between God and us. With it. So that's how they start out. These first two questions um, does God listen to all prayers? And we can say with them, with merit, some minor disagreements, yes, God does not listen to all prayers. He, he does not, and he hates the prayers of the wicked. And how should we pray? Um, we should pray from the heart. It should be worshipful. It's as Calvin, as I mentioned earlier, Calvin said, this idea of reverent. You just don't flippantly go to God. We come reverently before the king, though he is our father. And we should take joy and comfort in that with it. So the next thing is on after how we should pray is why do Christians meet together? And again, they have two kind of sections with this one and it kind of draws off. So you have this kind of personal idea of prayer, a close communion between you and God. They're going to move to now this idea of <clears throat> Sorry, this idea of coming together. And so we can, and we can identify with that. That is um, something good, something we should consider that we are to draw close. And so they say, Drawing close to God is not easy because we live among people who lack faith in God and ridicule his promises and peace on earth. First Timothy 3, 3, 1 and 4. And we know that this in the last days, critical times, hard to deal with will be there. I think it's persecution in the ESV. Then they go, portrayers, headstrong, puffed up with pride, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. That's probably what they're trying to get at. And is that we live in this world that hates God and and. I mean, I don't have to try to defend that. I mean, agree with that. 
So we need encouragement associating association with other believers, and they need us. And so you have Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and it says, let us, they say, concide or stir up is how the ESV, one another to love and good works. And they have insight to love and fine works. Just weird translation stuff like that. Um, not forsaking meeting together as some have the custom, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. I would add even 21 and 23 to this um, about let us have full assurance of hope. Um, and then the aspect with faith, I think we should bundle these together because um, there is this let us and there is this mutual encouragement which is why we should attend church that's why i have i am a member of a local southern baptist church and my pastor just posted what he's going to be preaching on titus 1 1 through 4 and has encouraged us to read the text before we go and to meditate and to be prepared to come and worship on sunday and this is a good thing we need to. We need to come together with it. So, you know, how can we draw near to God? There is a sense in which we got to draw near to each other with that. And not only that, um, the common associating with people who love God helps us to draw close to God. The meetings of Jehovah Witnesses provide fine opportunities to benefit from the faith of others. Again, um, here they have Romans 1. Paul says, For I am longing to see you that I may impart some spiritual gifts to you for you to be made firm, or rather that we may have interchange of encouragement by one another's faith, both yours and mine. So we see, again, Paul here um, understanding how these, how this works. And we are to come together. And so, again, yeah. And I think there is an aspect in which when we come together to worship God, that we do draw near to God. And that we should um, come in the reverent respect that God deserves in the on the how and how he wants to sorry <clears throat> how he has told us to and that we should be ones who are, are ready and prepared to worship and to talk spiritual things and to be engaged in each other's lives that brings us closer to God that brings us a more assured hope of the future that grounds our faith in the gospel and and that really and and stirs us up to be obedient to the word to the calling which we have been called so yes i would just say that if you're going to jehovah witness meetings you're actually not getting any of this because they are devoid of gospel truth and the true church is always marked by the right teaching of the word which they do not do and the right administration of the sacraments which are in part with the preaching so even if they are doing the lord's supper which they only do yearly and which and the baptism but they're not doing it correctly they're not doing it with the right understanding so therefore they um, because of their misunderstanding of the gospel, they're not teaching it. So they're not a true church. So this would be encouragement for you to find a biblical church, a church that preaches the word and practices the right administration of the sacraments or the ordinances or whatever you want to call them. Now, obviously, being a Baptist, what I think is the right administration of the ordinances is one thing and a Presbyterian may be another. And to you know, gospel preaching churches with it. And this is not time for that debate. So and I realized the distinctions there, but this has always been the true, even 
the reformers are talking about are drawing off of the early church saying this is what they thought about it and so that we should too so why should we meet why do we meet with other christians well it's because it's it's benefited it benefits both of us so the fourth question is how can you draw close to god so we've talked about prayer and how there's a sense in which we can draw close to god in prayer we talked about how as we meet together as christians biblical christians and the jehovah witnesses kind of you know have this same idea that meeting together as a church and being involved in church, um, not merely just attending, but being involved, um, helps us to grow together. The next is how can you draw close to God? And so they're going to say in lots of Bible, no, no, this one, but you're going to draw close to God with it. Again, we'll see some here things that we would want to add on. And so they go, you can draw close to God. How you can you draw close? You can draw close to Yahweh by meditating on what you have learned from his word. Com ah, of course, I'm not going to be able to say this word now. Um, meditate his activities, his advice, and his promises. Powerful Meditation builds appreciation for our heart, for God's love and his wisdom. And no doubt, we, we need to meditate on what we have learned from his word. But I think there's also an aspect in which, again, the Holy Spirit brings us to the truth. Again, missing from it. And so the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the word and to apply it into our heart. While meditation is good, if it doesn't move you to becoming a better Christian and encouraging you to be faithful, it's really kind of pointless. But, pow but prayerful meditation builds not an appreciation of in our hearts of God's love and his wisdom, which no doubt it does. But it just brings appreciation of who God is, how God is perfect, that in all that he does, he does not sin. There is nothing done outside of his will. And you see it in Joshua 1.8. Um, Joshua is receiving his commission from, from God. This book of law should not depart from your mind. You must read it. Read, read it in an undertone day and night in order to carefully to observe carefully all that is written in it. You know, then Psalm 1-3, happy, blessed is the man who walks not according to the advice of the wicked, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of Yahweh. And he reads his law in an undertone day and night he's like a tree planted by streams of water a tree that produces fruit in its seasons forages does not wither and everything he does like, succeed she just continued on but the wicked are not so but are like shaft driven away um that was esv that last part and so again meditation is an important part i mean you could do some 119 um is another good example on this and so yeah there's a way in which we draw to get we draw closer to God by studying his word and getting to know who he is and that our knowledge of him changes and affects us and that comes from the Holy Spirit with it and they also say now that you can draw close to God only if you trust in him if you have faith in him is how they word it now, I, I want to, to understand that, again, we understand faith differently than they do. And here they'll quote Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, faith is assured, expectation of what is hoped, the evident demonstrated of realities that are not seen. That is obviously a little bit different from how maybe like the ESV would read. I'm not going to... 
um, get into you know that too much. I'm trying to sorry find here. Um, where they have faith. Yes, all who exercise faith in Jesus by obeying him will enjoy life in a paradise on earth. So their idea of faith is obedience. All who exercise faith in Jesus by obeying him. We obviously don't understand trust and faith that way. We understand that we put our faith in him because he saves us from our souls. He saves us from what we deserve. He saves our souls from what we deserve. There we go. There's the coherent sentence. And so, yeah, we stay close by him by faith. But this faith is, while it's our own, it does not come from within us. They continue, but faith is like a living thing that needs feeding. You must constantly feed your faith by reviewing the basis for your beliefs. Again, their their idea of faith is is kind of an obedience um, with it, and so they're really kind of confused here. Um, And how they're they're reading this, and if you if you understood some other things, and they've said other things in the back um, before, and in a sense, I don't want to I don't want to disagree with them that you must constantly feed your faith, but I want to disagree with them, and I think a lot of that is because who is the author and perfecter? Of your faith. Who is the one. Who gives you faith. We can think about Ephesians 2. 8 and 9. Now they just say this is to the elect. They're just going to completely dismiss this. And that. And even if you give them. The Greek apologetic. That the idea that. In the context that both faith. And grace are gifts of God. Not by works. Lest any, man should, lest any man should boast, is the idea that our faith comes from outside of us. It is given to us. Yes, we exercise faith, and yes, we believe after God has regenerated our hearts and what we are, and our natures are changed, that we may believe with it. And that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we should understand that and recognize that with it but at the same time the faith isn't something we do we have faith but it starts out by as being a gift to us that then the spirit grows that as philippians 2 says that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling knowing that it is not us who work but god working in us and that when we choose to obey and to not sin that God is working and helping us in that way so their answers to how can you draw close to God here in this section is a meditation and I would say yes we need to meditate on the word that is how we um, obey God but it's not the basis of our faith um, that we do it, that in meditating on God, we our faith is renewed because of we read and we see how God is unchangeable, that His promises are sure, and that. So, and in a sense, then that is reviewing the basis, and that our assurance, and our our faith and assurance are correlated. The more faith we have, 
the more assurance we may have. And that assurance, while we may have faith, does show a, a lack of faith. Um, and though I'd agree with J.C. Ryle in saying that God may not always give assurance to people. So finally, how can you draw close? How does drawing close to God benefit you? And so to close this out, Yahweh cares for those who love him. And he does. He protects them from anything that could jeopardize their faith and their hope and everlasting life. And at this point, I say, you missed it. He does care. He does protect. He can't, he just, it's not that he can protect. It's that he does protect us from anything that jeopardizes our faith and our hope in everlasting life, which is them, the created heavens, the recreated earth, the created, the created earth, not dwelling with God. When I consider everlasting life, again, this is a previous episode, everlasting life to the Christian is dwelling with God forever. We do make a difference in that. But again, Philippians 1.6 the one who begins a good work in you will complete it. Jesus said, all who my father has given to me received and he will not lose one of them. This is the assurance. God, God just doesn't is yes. He's able. Can he protect us? Yes. He can protect us because he is the one who protects us. And if it is in our own sinful body, we would walk away. Bound my heart. Like a th he, he is to, to come to us. They have Psalm 91.1. Anyone dwelling in the sacred place of the Most High will lodge under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, Yahweh. You are my refuge, my stronghold, my God in whom I trust. And we can say yes because God is able and God is the one who does it. I walk faithfully. God is the one who protects me with it. And so I think there is this idea of Philippians 1, six that they just kind of move over. Now they're libertarian free will. Your everlasting life is based on obedience and so you have it. And he continues on the next um, with it. He warns us against the way of life that threatens our health and happiness. Yahweh teaches us the best way of life. And so that last one, um, Yahweh teaches us the best way of life. Yes, it is through his wisdom and it's through trials with it. I do think he warns us against the ways of life that threaten our health and happiness. I think there is, yes, he does that and wisdom shows us that. But that when we consider Lady Wisdom, there is health, there is seemingly prosperity with it. Obviously, when you read Ecclesiastes, the rich, the evil get rich and the poor seem, or the the evil get rich and the righteous become poor and persecuted. That is kind of how this life works. So he does warn us against way life that threatens our health and our happiness. Because really it's disobedience to him. It's not following the way of wisdom. It's following the way of folly. And he teaches us the best way of life. But again, they don't have a view of persecution. We saw this really early on that that God is here just to make here he says soon he will act to provide a better future for people in every land. This comes from our first would have been in our first lesson. This is 
the god who they have. And so that's, um, so the push is, this will have, the push is same as Jumbo Olstein. Have your best life now. You follow God, you will have your best life now. Except for why did Polycarp die to the lions? Why did Paul, as tradition say, was crucified upside down? What about the recent converts to Christianity? They were Muslim and they just got killed for their faith. What about them? Will this message have your best life now? Help them out when they're when Christians are sitting in jail waiting to die because of their faith? Jesus doesn't call us to have our best life now. He calls us to obedience and to wisdom and to live in God's world the way God wants to. And you know what? It doesn't bring us a bed of roses. It brings us persecution. So that when they say, as in James 4.4, 4, adulterous, do you not know that friendship with the world is enemy with God? Adulteress is kind of seemingly out of place here. This is not actually talking about a fornicator. James here is talking about kind of the idolater, the one who worships up something else, someone who is against God. So whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world is making himself an enemy of God. On James 4, 8, draw close to God, he'll draw close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you indecisive ones. Again, that's a good call to draw, to draw close to God. You have to be clean. That's what the temple symbolized. But we have a better sacrifice who died in our place that we can now boldly approach, and that's Christ. But they deny that. They deny Jesus as our substitutionary atonement that cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. And that only he who is God could have done that. So we're going to see how our understanding of the gospel affects everything. And so that has been our show for tonight. So how do we draw close to God? They would answer by prayers, comes from the hearts. No doubt I agree with that. Um, in a sense, that could be written. It could be memorized and used properly. How do Christians meet together? And we, we somewhat agree. We have to come together. We have to go to church. And that's how we can draw close to God and the fellowship of other believers listening to the word. And how can you draw close to God? You can also do it by meditating on his word and let the Holy Spirit teach you, which they deny. And then how can drawing close to God benefit you? Well, if you don't draw close to God, he will not draw close to you. If you do not come to him in the way that he has deemed through his son, through faith, through repentance and faith in the son, then you can't, you can't come. Now they deny that and that you need obedience for everlasting life. So that's the show. I appreciate you for coming and listening to me. I do uh, want to plague that we have Ryan Denton from Christ in the Wilds Ministry. Um, will be our special guest on Tuesday. Interview him talking about open air and evangelism. He has a new book out, so we'll touch a little bit about that. 
and just to to consider evangelism and open air preaching um, with that. So join us Tuesday at 9 p.m. on YouTube. Watch our Facebook for links um, to be able to do that. Or you can just go to YouTube, subscribe. You click on that little bell like every other YouTube channel tells you to do, and you'll be notified when we go live um, there. But obviously Facebook, we try to keep that Facebook kind of our announcement area to go um, for it. We're coming quickly up to our 400th episode. I've been holding back on posting these so to kind of give us more time. Um, so we're in the we're in the we're taking the time to uh, be able to plan that and to um, do something a little bit special for the 40 400th episode. And so I've already proposed that for the 500th episode, so like another like two years, and probably less than two years because how we post things um that we do a live show together all of us in one location um so tell ricky to make that happen really kind of tell george to clear out some space in his time to go make that happen probably the best way to do that and so we want to thank you all for joining me tonight on this saturday night episode jehovah witness episode 12 drawing close to god i hope you enjoyed the show um, on check out Podbean to check out all of our podcasts and the Jehovah series, Jehovah Witness series when they are posted. Also, I've created a Facebook playlist to where you can catch all the shows <coughs> as they are um, uploaded. You can also check um, the Penal Substitutionary Atonement episodes George's have been doing um I've we've put all the 2019 podcast shows Tuesday night shows together so you can binge watch those go check them out I've been working on some other things too um on YouTube to try to keep to get us out there um a little bit more um because you know, hopefully we're making good quality content um, with that. So for this episode of the Witnesses, I've been Mike. And thank you for joining. Maybe one of the reasons so many people in the church aren't making disciples of all nations is because they're not really disciples in the first place. You think about Jesus and his disciples from the very beginning to the very end. Making disciples is in the DNA of this thing, right? To be a disciple involves making disciples. Follow me, Matthew 4, and I will, what? I'll make you fishers of men. Never make a gospel appeal to people's emotions. Never. Never. That's why we don't have some kind of an emotional appeal here and play all kinds of smaltzy music in the background. And it amazes me that we believe this, that God would crush and kill his own son, but let you slide. Not for a minute. At this moment, God commands all men to repent and believe that today is the day of salvation, that you are to flee from the wrath to come, to flee from the law of Moses that condemns you into the city of refuge who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Run to Him.